Chances are, you're holding a smartphone right now. Maybe you've got an electric car in the garage. These are the tools of our modern world. But what powers them, what makes them possible, is a cocktail of rare metals pulled from the earth. For generations, the story of these minerals has been the same. Immense wealth flowing out of Africa, the global south, and into the economic engines of the north and east. Resource-rich nations stay poor, their lands scarred by digging, while the prophets built cities thousands of miles away. But what if that story could finally be rewritten? What if a nation known for gold and cocoa suddenly realized it was sitting on the building blocks of the future? And what if, this time, it decided that wealth should stay home? This is what's happening in Ghana right now. The country is at a crossroads, where huge discoveries of critical minerals have sparked a bold, new strategy. This isn't just about finding treasure. It's about flipping the entire game on its head. It's a high-stakes bet to reclaim economic control, one that could shake up global supply chains, challenge superpowers, and forge a new path for an entire continent. The world is about to see what happens when a nation decides to keep its trillions for itself. For most of its history, Ghana's mineral wealth meant one thing, gold. As Africa's biggest gold producer, the country's economy has always danced to the tune of its fluctuating price. But just beneath the surface, a completely new story was waiting to be told. In late 2024, a team of Ghanaian researchers from the University of Mines and Technology, UMAT, and the University of Johannesburg announced something that sent a jolt through the global minerals industry. While doing surveys in southern Ghana's Kibi Winiba Belt, they found something incredible. Tucked away in igneous rocks called pegmatites, they identified huge quantities of a metal so vital to technology, it's named after a figure from Greek myth, Tantalum. So what is Tantalum? Well, it's one of the unsung heroes of our time. It's a shiny, silvery metal that's incredibly resistant to corrosion and heat. Its most important job is making high-performance capacitors, tiny components that are absolutely essential for managing power in everything from iPhones and laptops to the complex electronics in jet engines and medical equipment. And as the world shifts to green energy, tantalum is more important than ever. It's a key ingredient that helps solar panels, wind turbines, and electric vehicles work. The discovery at the Biwad's Mount Code site wasn't just some minor deposit. The research, led by Dr. Emmanuel Danoba Sankari of UMAT, described vast, tantalum-rich rocks, pointing to a resource with massive economic potential. The researchers noted that if these deposits were mined, they could dramatically boost Ghana's income and help power the global energy transition. This find alone was enough to change the conversation about Ghana's future. But the story didn't end there. Hundreds of kilometers away, in the Oti region, another state-led exploration was happening. The Ghana Integrated Iron and Steel Development Corporation, GISTEC, was drilling for iron ore, a key part of the country's industrial plans. But during their work in the Jamaru mountain range, they hit something they weren't even looking for. Sample after sample showed consistent traces of another, even more strategic battery metal, nickel. In some spots, the nickel concentrations were over 1%, a key threshold that's considered commercially viable and very attractive for mining. Nickel is the powerhouse of the EV revolution. It's a primary component in the cathodes of lithium-ion batteries, and it's what determines how far an electric car can go on a single charge. With the world scrambling to lock down battery metals, demand for high-grade nickel has gone through the roof. The CEO of Gistic, William Okofudate, immediately understood how big this accidental discovery was. He stated publicly that they wouldn't just let an investor come in for iron ore and then walk away with the nickel as a surprise bonus. The new plan is to do a full analysis to understand exactly what they have, the grade, the volume, and the quality of all the minerals before any deals are made. This careful, strategic thinking shows a huge shift. This isn't a chaotic resource rush, it's a calculated chess move.
Together, these discoveries of tantalum and nickel mark a new era for Ghana. The nation is no longer just a gold producer. It's now a potential powerhouse of the very minerals that will build our green and digital world. The total value could be staggering, with some dreaming of a trillion dollar mineral base that could reshape the nation's destiny. But this discovery is also a test, because in Africa, finding incredible wealth has too often been a blessing for the world, but a curse for the nation itself. To get why Ghana is making such bold moves now, you have to look at the painful history it has with its own resources. For centuries, the story of African minerals has been about one thing, extraction, not development. It's a story that starts in an African mine, but ends in a European factory or an Asian tech company, with almost none of the final profit returning to where it all began. Ghana, despite being a stable democracy and a top gold producer, has lived this story. For decades, foreign companies ran the large-scale mines, while the small-scale sector, known as Galamsey, was a chaotic free-for-all. While this Galamsey mining provides a living for many, it also opened the door for massive revenue losses and environmental ruin. The model was simple, and for foreign interests, it worked perfectly. Traders would go into local markets, buy gold directly from small-scale miners, often below market price, and export it with very little oversight. Billions of dollars in gold just vanished from the country, legally and illegally, making the currency unstable and robbing the government of desperately needed tax money. The environmental damage has been a nightmare. Unregulated mining has destroyed forests and poisoned over 60% of Ghana's water bodies with mercury and other toxins. This system created a strange paradox. Ghana was the number one gold producer in Africa, yet it faced the same economic problems as its neighbors with far fewer resources, high inflation, joblessness, and a currency on a roller coaster. A 2019 study, for example, highlighted a staggering disparity, suggesting that of the $5.2 billion in gold produced between 1990 and 2002, the government received only $87.3 million, or about 1.7%. While more recent analyses suggest the government's take is now much higher, the historical pattern has left a deep scar. This is the old playbook, written during colonial times and perfected for a globalized world. It's a playbook that treats African nations like giant quarries, sources of raw stuff, not centers of industry. Raw bauxite gets dug up and shipped out to be turned into valuable aluminum somewhere else. Raw manganese is exported, only to be processed into high-grade steel alloys in another country. The real value is added thousands of miles away, and so are the jobs, the technology, and the wealth. This long frustrating history of watching its wealth walk out the door is exactly why things are changing. The discoveries of tantalum and nickel aren't just a new business opportunity. They're a chance to finally break the cycle. The Ghanaian government, with the backing of a population hungry for economic justice, has looked at this painful past and decided, never again. They are done being just the first and least profitable step in the supply chain. The new strategy isn't just about managing new minerals. It's about taking back control over all of them. With this historic opportunity in front of them, Ghana is writing a new national playbook, and it's built on a principle called resource nationalism. This isn't about closing the country off. It's about completely changing the terms of the deal with the rest of the world. The main idea is simple. The days of exporting raw materials just so foreign companies can get rich are over. The future is about adding value at home, keeping control, and making sure the wealth from Ghanaian soil builds Ghana's future. The first, and most dramatic, move came in early 2025, and it hit the very heart of the old system, the gold market. The government passed a powerful new law, the Ghana Gold Board Act. This law created a new state-run agency called the Ghana Gold Board, or Gold Board for short, and its mission. It was a complete game-changer. Effective May 1, 2025, 
All foreigners were banned from the domestic gold trading market. All old licenses for trading gold locally were instantly void. Just like that, the old model was torn down. Under this new system, Goldbod became the one and only legal buyer of gold from the country's massive small-scale mining sector. Foreign buyers who used to go straight to the mining towns now have to buy their gold from Goldbod at a price set by the state based on global rates. The goals are to capture state revenue, stabilize the currency by controlling gold exports, and finally get a grip on the smuggling and illegal mining that have been bleeding the country dry. This wasn't some small regulatory change. It was a total overhaul, sending a clear message that the government is ready to act decisively to take back control. This gold market revolution is the blueprint for how Ghana plans to handle its new mineral wealth. The slow and steady approach to the nickel discovery is the next piece of the puzzle. By demanding a full analysis of the resource before talking to investors, Gistek is making sure that Ghana, not some foreign corporation, holds all the cards. They'll walk into negotiations knowing exactly what they have. So there are no surprise windfalls for partners who might know more about the geology than they do. The third part of this strategy is maybe the most ambitious an aggressive push for local processing. The government's dream isn't just to dig up tantalum and nickel. It's to build the industries that actually use them. Why export raw nickel ore when you could process it into the much more valuable nickel sulfate needed for batteries? Why ship tantalum concentrate overseas when you could be making capacitors for the world's electronics right there in Ghana? That's the big idea. This thinking is already being applied to other resources. The government has made it clear plans to restrict exports on other key minerals, like lithium, to make sure the processing happens in country. There are serious plans for an integrated iron and steel industry, using local iron ore to make steel for Ghana and all of West Africa. Talk of banning raw bauxite exports is part of the same strategy all aimed at building a domestic aluminum industry instead of just shipping the raw dirt to China. This is what it really means to lock out the old ways. It's not about slamming the door on all foreign investment. It's about locking out the old, exploitative model where foreign companies controlled everything from the mine to the market. The new Ghana is open for business, but only for partners who will play by a new set of rules. Rules that require joint ventures, local factories, shared technology, and a fair cut of the profits staying right there in Ghana. It's a powerful declaration of economic independence, using the leverage of its new discoveries to force the world to treat it as an equal partner, not just a quarry. This shift in Ghana is part of a bigger awakening across Africa, as nations get tired of watching their wealth build prosperity somewhere else. Do you think this strategy of resource nationalism can actually work. What are the biggest hurdles Ghana will face? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And if you find this story as fascinating as I do, make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss our next story on the huge forces reshaping our world. Ghana's bold new plan isn't happening in a bubble. It's a calculated move on a global chessboard where the pieces are critical minerals and the players are superpowers. The decision to take control of its own tantalum and nickel, and to completely remake its gold market, is sending shockwaves from Washington to Beijing. The world is in a mad dash for the resources that power the green energy transition and our digital lives. Tantalum and nickel are right at the top of that shopping list. For decades the West, and more recently China, have relied on a global system that gave them easy access to cheap raw materials. Ghana's new playbook is a direct attack on that system. For Western tech giants and car companies, this is a big deal. Companies that need a steady supply of tantalum for their gadgets and nickel for their EV batteries are facing a new world. The days of getting cheap, raw minerals from a loosely regulated African market might be over. Now, they'll have to deal with a powerful, state-run gatekeeper like Goldbod or whatever comes next for these new minerals. That means potentially higher prices, tougher contracts, and pressure to invest in factories inside Ghana. 
This brings both risk and opportunity. The risk is a supply chain nightmare. If Ghana's new system is too difficult to work with, it could create major delays for industries already facing mineral shortages. But it's also a chance for companies who are willing to be real partners. The ones that step up and invest in Ghanaian refineries and factories could lock in a stable, long-term supply and get on the good side of a government that's quickly becoming a major player in strategic resources. And then there's the geopolitics. Right now, China processes most of the world's critical minerals. By vowing to build its own processing plants, Ghana is making a direct play to challenge that dominance and climb up the value chain. This lines up perfectly with the goals of the United States and Europe, who are desperate to find new supply chains that don't run through China. A resource sovereign Ghana could become a key, non-aligned supplier in this new great game. It can play the competition between the East and West to its own advantage, cutting better deals for itself by playing one superpower against the other. The West might be willing to offer huge investments and technology to help build Ghana's industries just to secure a source of critical minerals outside of China's grip. What's more, other resource-rich nations all across Africa are watching Ghana very, very closely. Countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo, with its cobalt, or Zambia, with its copper, are all dealing with the same old story of exploitation. If Ghana's model works, if it successfully boosts state revenues, builds local industry, and improves the lives of its people, it could become the blueprint for an entire continent. It could kickstart a massive shift towards resource sovereignty across Africa and completely change the global balance of power between the countries that produce resources and those that consume them. The success or failure of Ghana's gamble won't just decide its own future. It could set the stage for a new era in global economics. Ghana is on the edge of a transformation that could be just as important as its own independence. The discovery of high-grade tantalum and nickel has handed it a golden ticket, not just to get rich, but to completely remake its economic future. The plan is in motion. An assertive strategy to seize control of its resources, demand that the value is added inside the country, and rewrite the rules of the game. This is a nation that is refusing to be just a quarry anymore. It wants to be a factory, a laboratory, and an economic power in its own right. But the road ahead is full of challenges. The dream of building a domestic industry to process minerals like nickel and tantalum needs a staggering amount of money, cutting-edge technology, and a highly skilled workforce, all things that are in short supply right now. Can Ghana find the right kind of partners to help build this industrial base without just falling into a different kind of dependency? But here's the real test, can they actually pull it off? State-run bodies like Goldbord can be incredible engines for national progress, but they can also fall victim to corruption and bad management if they aren't run with total transparency. The government has to make sure this new wealth benefits everyone by funding schools, hospitals and infrastructure, instead of just ending up in the pockets of a few. Finally, you can bet there will be enormous pressure from the outside. Powerful corporations and countries that benefited from the old way of doing things won't just sit back and watch it change. They might try to undermine Ghana's strategy through politics, trade disputes, or by trying to scare off investors. Ghana is going to need unshakable political will and the full support of its people to stay the course. Despite all the risks, what's happening in Ghana is a powerful story of a nation taking control. It's a rejection of a centuries-old script of exploitation and a bold demand for an equal seat at the global table. For the first time, the conversation isn't just about the value of what's being pulled from the ground, but about the value of the nation itself. Ghana's journey is a defining test for our time. Can a resource-rich African nation finally capture its own wealth and build its own future? The world is watching, and the answer will be heard far beyond its borders. Tell us what you think in the comments section below, and please do not forget to like and subscribe for more informative videos like this one.